started with today's colloquium, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tyler Kugla. Tyler comes to us today from the University of Washington, but I'm going to start with, he did his undergraduate at Northwestern working in the mid-American continent with Brad Sageman. Um, and then he went on to Stanford where he started working on climate with Paige Chamberlain and he started working with oxygen isotopes and clay minerals and um, isotopes and things like that which got me interested in his work. After that he went to Colorado State where he worked with Jeremy Rubenstein on a one-year postdoc and since November he's been at the University of Washington and Oregon State. Do you live in between or in, in Seattle? Seattle? Yeah, in Seattle. I would live there too. After two <laughs> weeks in Corvallis, I would choose Seattle as well. Um, I won't tell he, my Oregon State colleagues that. Yeah, <laughs> where he's on a climate and global change fellowship with NOAA. Interestingly, he turned down an NSF postdoc to take the NOAA postdoc. And with that, I am not going to take any more of Tyler's time, and I'm going to hand it off to Tyler, who's going to present precipitation seasonality in the geologic past. Tyler. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Um, actually, I don't mind having the lights on, if that's okay. Uh, as a fellow audience member myself, I know that it gets tiresome sometimes with the lights off. Um, is it, can we see the screen all right? Is that all right? Okay. This is great. Uh, and my cursor is here. All right, today's topic is precipitation seasonality in the geologic past. And my understanding is that the seasonal cycle of precipitation here in Piscataway, uh, New Brunswick, is a little bit wetter in the summer, a little bit uh, drier in the winter, but overall a pretty flat seasonal cycle. The question that we have today is when throughout the year is it raining? Uh, of course, there are other places that are much more summer wet than where we are right now, often monsoon climates. And where I'm coming from in Seattle is much more winter wet. Our summers are very dry and we get almost all of our rainfall in the cold months. And what I understand from talking to lots and lots of people about precipitation seasonality is that this is one of the most mundane features of the climate system. Uh, it's maybe not all that exciting. So why dedicate a whole talk to it, let alone uh, a larger chunk of a career? What I wanna talk about today is how precipitation seasonality can inform some of the most uncertain aspects of the Earth's system and how it responds to change. And in order to illustrate this point, uh, I want to start by talking about Toadstool Geologic Park in Nebraska. Before we do though, I should mention, today we're going to talk about a proxy system that I'm developing. And this is a big project with a lot of fantastic colleagues, Jeremy Rugenstein, Carolyn Stromberg, Marisa Legu, Kate Huntington, Dan Ibarra, and Matt Winnick across a bunch of different institutions. Uh, and so all of them will be featured at some point throughout the talk today. Uh, but this work begins, again, in Toadstool Geologic Park. Uh, I know some folks here have probably been to this site. The rocks that you're looking at here, these are fossilized soils, about 30 million years old. And they record information about a time when this landscape looked very different from how it looks today. The fossils here and the geochemical fingerprints here indicate that 30 million years ago, the Great Plains and much of the Western US with it was much more densely covered by forests than it is today. And about 25 million years ago, there was this episode of widespread forest dieback. It's one of the largest ecological transitions that we have data for on the planet in the last 50, 60 million years. And we don't know why it happened. One of the leading hypotheses is that summers got drier. And we'll talk about this hypothesis throughout the day today. But what I wanna start with is why this hypothesis is such a hard one to get at. Uh, number one, summer aridity and its relationship to plants al al along the landscape, especially in the mid-latitudes, is not well understood. It's not well understood that drier summers could be the sole driver of this massive episode of forest dieback. We don't really understand the ecosystem dynamics. Similarly, there are a lot of things that can cause drier summers, and we don't know which one of them might have been relevant 25 million years ago. We don't really understand the atmospheric dynamics. And finally, there are a whole bunch of really great archives and rocks just like these, but we don't have a great proxy system that helps us understand the seasonal moisture balance, especially in places like the mid-latitude. So it's a difficult hypothesis to test with empirical data. And that's what we're going to talk about today in the discussion of a new proxy system that I've been developing that helps us reconstruct the seasonal moisture balance in deep time. So we're going to talk about precipitation seasonality, and we'll talk about it in three parts. 
We'll first talk about why it's important and what sort of useful information we can get if we understand the seasonal cycle of rainfall in the, in the geologic past. We'll then dive into how do we actually detect it? What sort of tools do we have available to us to get information about something happening over the course of months, but millions and millions of years ago? And finally, we're going to address this problem of whether summer aridity caused this massive episode of forest dieback in the western US about 25 million years ago. We're going to apply this proxy system that I've been developing to the western US. <coughs> so to get started, uh, why is it important? Why do we care? In order to understand why we might want to look to precipitation seasonality in the past, it's useful to think a little bit about the future. Uh, this is a figure from the recent AR6 report from IPCC, and the blue colors indicate places where we might have more rainfall in a warmer world. The brown colors are places where we might have less rainfall in a warmer world. And the big challenge here is that there's a lot of uncertainty with these predictions. There's a lot of disagreement from model to model. And that disagreement comes because we don't really understand the fundamental relationship between atmospheric circulation or atmospheric dynamics, especially on a seasonal time scale, and climate. This is a really complicated relationship to get at. This shows up in a lot of ways. For, uh, in one instance, we don't really understand whether or not the Hadley cells will expand poleward in a warmer world. Uh, we don't know what might happen to the mid-latitude jet streams in a warmer world. And there's a whole host of challenges in the tropics associated with the intertropical co convergence zone, its relationship to different monsoons and walker circulation, where there's a whole host of uncertainty about what might happen in a warmer world. Understanding seasonal precipitation in the past can help us pin down the response of certain circulation features in the atmosphere to changes in climate. One of the reasons this is also a problem is that the uncertainty associated with future rainfall, along with a lot of other uncertainty associated with ecosystem dynamics, leads to a great deal of uncertainty in the future of water availability. So this is a figure from Chef et al. in 2017. And all of the dots here, these are places where models agree that in a future warmer world, uh, they ag models agree on the sign of change, not even the magnitude, just the sign, whether it'll get uh, higher runoff or lower runoff, essentially more or less water availability. And one of the challenges here is that even in places where the models seem to agree, like the high latitudes in the northern hemisphere, uh, they agree for completely different reasons. So the real metric of model agreement here is not so great in the sense that there's not actually a lot of agreement, even when they do seem to agree. And in many places, they don't agree on even the sign of change, which is indicated by these uh, whiter colored boxes here, where we don't know if we're going to have more or less water in a warmer future world. And a lot of these places are in places that already rely on a very finite supply of water today, like the American Southwest and the Great Plains. The case I'm going to make is that precipitation seasonality can encode the fingerprint of atmospheric circulation and help us understand how circulation changes with climate and hopefully get a better understanding and chipping away at some of this uncertainty associated with water availability and how that will change in a warmer world. So precipitation seasonality, what is it? Uh, there are a whole bunch of different dimensions that we can take to this problem. And because we're going to focus on the mid-latitudes today, I'm going to talk about it from the sense of a more winter wet climate to a more mm -hmm. summer wet climate. This is the spectrum that we're going to use to consider precipitation seasonality. A more winter wet climate might have a monthly precipitation cycle that looks something like this, where it peaks in the winter and troughs in the summer. And a more summer wet climate, of course, is the opposite, peaks in the summer and troughs in the winter. And then we can have something in between. Today, we're going to focus on uh, the Western US. And the reason that we're going to focus on the Western US is that it marks this really sharp gradient from a very winter wet climate in the West to a very summer wet climate in the East. There's a huge signal here to play around with. Uh, and to build a better understanding about. And this gradient is primarily driven by atmospheric circulation. The first order driver of this gradient is that we have a wintertime moisture source coming in off of the Pacific, that's the westerlies, and that competes more or less with a summertime and springtime moisture source from the Gulf of Mexico called the Great Plains Low Level Jet, and they're active at different times of the year, competing to drive either a more winter wet climate at one time or a more summer wet climate at another. So the first key factor driving this gradient is atmospheric circulation. The second is how those circulation patterns interact with topography. The Cascades Mountains mark a really sharp decrease from a very winter wet climate on the west to a somewhat less winter wet climate on the lee side. And then the Continental Divide marks another big step from a somewhat winter wet climate to a summer wet climate as we approach the Great Plains. <coughs> 
So the fingerprint of atmospheric circulation and its interaction with topography can be found in the seasonal cycle of precipitation in the western US. And it's not just here. Uh, precipitation seasonality hosts, ha carries important information about atmospheric circulation on a global scale. So here's precipitation seasonality again. Summer wet is in the greens and winter wet is in the reds. This is the gradient we just talked about in the westerlies with the, the low level jet. There's also a gradient in the South American monsoon. We'll talk a bit about this later. There's a gradient from a weakening westerly moisture influence as you move across Eurasia. Uh, this gradient is also found in the East Asian monsoon. We'll talk about this at the very end of the talk too. And there's a strong gradient from north to south in Australia associated with the trade-off from the easterlies to the westerlies. And then of course a really strong gradient here as we see a shift from the Mediterranean to a monsoon climate region. So again, the fingerprint of atmospheric circulation patterns can be found in precipitation seasonality. This is one of the ways that we can empirically get at this problem in deep time. So this is the atmospheric dynamic side of things. We care about precipitation seasonality because it's a good indicator for these seasonal dynamics that are really hard to get at with models. But it's also really important for understanding something else, which is the broader resilience of terrestrial ecosystems to changes in climate the ecosystem dynamics. And that's because we know that seasonal moisture supply matters for plants, but we often don't know how. And I will put a disclaimer here, which is that I just noticed that the font is different on this slide, which means that a lot of my formatting is going to be messed up. We had some technical issues at the very end. So apologies in advance for any messed up formatting that comes ahead of this. Um, but to make this point, this is a figure from Allen et al. in 2019. The x-axis is roughly mean annual precipitation, and the y-axis is the hydrogen isotope composition of xylem water in trees during the growing season. So what are they measuring here? What they're essentially asking on the y-axis is, you can imagine taking a bucket, I should also mention, all of these measurements are trees in Switzerland, and what they're going to do is essentially assume that you have this bucket here that's collecting all of the rain that falls in the summer and the winter throughout the whole year, and there's no evaporation from this bucket. What the isotopic composition of that bucket will look like is the precipitation weighted average isotopic composition. So in Switzerland, the delta 2H ratio is lower in the winter and it's higher in the summer. So if you have more rainfall happening in the winter, you'll have a lower isotopic composition of your bucket. The question is, what water are plants using relative to what's available to them? If they're basically just pulling water indiscriminately from this bucket, from the precipitation weighted average, these data will fall on zero on the y-axis here. If they're using more winter moisture, they'll fall below zero to a more negative value. And if they're using more summer moisture, they'll fall above zero to a more positive value. And what they found is that all across Switzerland, unless you have very high precipitation rates, trees are predominantly using more winter moisture than is relatively being supplied across the landscape. And there's a good reason for this. Winter moisture is really important for recharging groundwater and recharging soil water, and we have snow melt that comes in in the spring. Winter, mo winter moisture is readily available. So we know that winter moisture matters. We also know that we see a really similar relationship in the western US. Trees are using relatively more winter moisture than is being supplied to the landscape. But what this doesn't tell us is what happens if we take away winter moisture. Is winter moisture really going to be a primary stressor? of these plants or will they adapt and use more summer moisture? What happens if you take away summer moisture? Are they using winter moisture because there's enough available in the summer and they don't need it? This isn't really answered in this plot here, but looking through the geologic past to these times when we have major vegetation transitions or even times of major climatic change but vegetation stasis, we can get a sense for how resilient terrestrial ecosystems are to changes in the seasonal availability of moisture. So we care about it for the atmospheric dynamics, also for the ecosystem dynamics. What I want to talk about now is how do we actually get information about the seasonal cycle of rainfall in the past. This is a hard problem and people have been working on this for a very long time. If you want information about seasonality in the past, the first option is to look for something that forms sub-seasonally, something that forms on a time scale that actually captures month-by-month-ish variations in climate and what's happening. Uh, there's a lot of options available to us here. You could look at uh, bivalves. This is the first uh, formatting issue as the word seasonally is cut off, but that's okay. You know it's there. Uh, we can look at bivalves. We can look at tooth enamel. If you sample it at a really high resolution, we can look at tree rings. Some speleothems even record seasonal piece, pieces of information and sub-seasonal. So we can capture seasonal geochemical fingerprints, potentially from millions of years ago if we use this material. But there are some problems. 
One of them is that for any one of these materials here, it will, they'll generally record at most a few seasonal cycles of information. If you want to scale that up to the mean state, 50 million years ago, a statistically significant mean, you need a lot of samples in order to actually capture that when you're, each of your uh, samples itself is giving you maybe a few seasonal cycles. The other challenge is that this material is not always readily available in the rock record. It's not super easy to find. So not only do we need a lot of samples, but we need a lot of samples from places where we have an abundance of a lot of this biogenic material, or if we're lucky enough to find something that is forming faster. But the bigger problem here is that the seasonal information that we can get from these types of materials doesn't always tell us about the seasonal, seasonal moisture supply. So as an example, let's take the, the Western US as a case study here. Uh, I'm gonna split this up into three domains. This Western domain in purple, a central domain in orange, and this Eastern domain in yellow. And I'm doing this because they roughly correspond with three different regions of precipitation seasonality. We're going to carry these domains with us throughout the talk. Uh, the Western domain is winter wet. The central domain is something in between. And the Eastern domain is summer wet. Three completely different precipitation seasonality regimes. With these materials, we can measure, for example, the monthly or seasonal distribution of oxygen isotopes in rainfall or precipitation. And the problem is that in the Western US, that signal is not related to the seasonality of precipitation. All across the Western US, we have low 18O in the winter and high 18O in the summer. You can't distinguish whether you're in a winter wet climate or a summer wet climate with the seasonal cycle of precipitation alone. So this is giving us some information about seasonal climate. It's just that it's not seasonal moisture availability, which is what we care for if we want to test this hypothesis of summer aridity driving a massive ecological transition. So what can we do instead? Uh, what we're going to talk about today is looking at something that can have a seasonal bias. We're going to compare two types of minerals that exist in paleosols that are commonly found all across the mid-latitudes and much of the world. And these are soil carbonates and orthogenic clays. Carbonates and clays form under two very different chemical reaction pathways. And carbonates especially tend to be biased to form at a specific time of the year, generally the drier and warmer times of the year. So we can use the difference in their oxygen isotopes as an indicator for when we're getting most of our seasonal moisture. And I'll talk about the theory for why this works now. We're gonna dive into the theoretical foundation for why this should work, and then get into the applying this uh, to the Western US. I'm gonna get the worst part of the theory out of the way first, and that is the orthogenic clays. This is essentially the most recent modern calibration study for oxygen isotopes and orthogenic clays, and it's 1971, and we're not going to go into the details of this figure here. I'm working on modern calibrations right now to, to bring some more recent data here. Uh, but the main idea is that clays are capturing something like the long-term precipitation weighted oxygen isotopic composition of rainfall. That's what Lawrence and Taylor argued in 1971. And this is something that is born out of uh, laboratory experiments and field measurements that we see, which tell us that clays take a very long time to form. The key thing about clays is that they just form too slowly to really capture some kind of strong seasonal bias on these long time scales. And if they do capture a seasonal bias, it is generally believed from the theory that we have and from the measurements that have been made that they're probably telling us more about the wetter times of the year or the long term mean. Again, this is the weakest part of the theory, and this is something that needs to be built out. And I'll talk about later why we still think this works in the application of the Western US, uh, but we're working on modern calibration studies right now, as well as geochemical modeling to test the theory for how this works. The problem with orthogenic clays is not many labs measure them, but this is not the problem with soil carbonates, where they are measured all around the world and routinely and all the time. With soil carbonates, uh, this is, by the way, I'm gonna show you a compilation from Julia Kelson in 2020 that I've updated to include one paper published uh, after Julia's compilation. And we now understand pretty well that soil carbonates are very seasonally biased, especially relative to clays, which will tell us not really about the dry time of the year. Soil carbonates do like to tell us about the dry time of the year. And one of the reasons that we feel pretty confident about this is that we can now measure the temperature at which the carbonates are forming with this cool new method, newish, called clumped isotope thermometry. Uh, and so what I'm showing you on the y-axis is the temperature at which the carbonate is forming as measured through clumped isotopes. And the x-axis is summer aridity, and these are all modern carbonates. Well, modern as in as recent as we can find them. So uh, 
if a data point falls along zero on the y-axis, that means that the carbonate formation temperature is similar to mean annual temperature. It's forming roughly during mean annual conditions. If it falls below zero, that means that carbonates are forming at the relatively colder times of the year. And if it falls above zero, they're forming at the relatively warmer times of the year. So winter below, summer above. I'm going to show you just the driest summers first. That's all of the data to the right, uh, to the left, <laughs> to the left. And then we'll get to the wetter summers next. So if you have a really dry summer, sorry, a wet summer, I'm all mixed up right now, recalibrated wet summer, uh, and you have a dry winter. These are the data points of the, the dark red. So a wet summer and a dry winter. Carbonates are forming in the winter. They're forming at the colder times of the year below this dashed line. If you have a wet summer and a wet winter, these are the data points that are lighter, carbonates still tend to form in the summer above that dashed line because that's when most of the evaporation is happening to concentrate your cations and actually form the carbonate. So wet summer, dry winter, carbonates are forming at the dry time of the year. Wet summer, wet winter, uh, they're forming more in the summer and then they continue to form in the summer. I gave myself little notes so I could not have this mix up and I still had it. Uh, if they're forming in the drier summers, they're capturing mostly the summertime bias. They're forming at the warm times of the year. And we see that there's uh, some data points that fall, fall near zero here when you have a really dry summer and a dry winter. But the main takeaway here is that unless you have a really wet summer, carbonates are forming at the warmer, drier times of the year. They're telling us about warm, dry conditions. What matters is that it's warm, dry relative to the clays, which we'll get to in a moment. The reason, so clays are telling us more about the wetter times, carbonates are telling us more about the drier times, but the reason that clays and carbonates in particular work, more so than just about any other two minerals that you could compare to one another, is that they have this really special uh, coincidence where they quote unquote tell us if they're recording the same environmental conditions. That means they're recording the same isotopic composition of the water and the forming at the same temperature as each other. So they're in co-equilibrium. What I mean by that is that whether we're looking at smectite or kaolinite across a wide range of environmental temperatures, the difference between clays and carbonates is basically the same. These two lines are flat and they're very similar to one another. They're about minus three and a half per mil across a wide range of temperatures. If I pull a clay and a carbonate from the same outcrop from the same place and I measure their 18O, it doesn't matter what the 18O is, if it's offset by about three and a half per mil, this is an indication that re they're recording the same environmental signals. This line, if you take any random two minerals that you might find in a paleosol or in a lake system, this line is very rarely flat. It's usually got some slope to it. And that means that you can't use the difference between the two minerals by itself to know if they're recording the same information or not. But because this line is flat here, we have this really useful piece of information where it's easy to tell off the bat by measuring the clay and the carbonate if they're on the line of co-equilibrium recording the same environmental information or if they're not. And what I can tell you after measuring a bunch of these and also compiling as much as I could find is that clay carbonate data rarely fall on this line. Usually what we find is that if the wet season is the high 18O season, clays take on that higher 18O and they're above this line. And if the wet season is the low 18O season, clays take on preferentially, relative to carbonates, the lower 18O, and the clay carbonate difference is below this line. We're going to come back to this. I threw a lot of that interpretive framework at you kind of off the bat, but we're going to apply this to how it works in the Western US in just a moment. The whole point of this is to give us the theoretical foundation for why this proxy system should work, and then we'll get into whether or not it does work uh, when we apply it to the Western US. So this is where we're going next. Uh, the first thing to know <laughs> about the Western US is that in the last 50 million years, there have been two phases of vegetation. And anybody that studies paleofloral reconstructions, I apologize. Uh, it is, of course, more complicated than this. But this is useful for understanding the key signal that we care about today, the main ecological transition, which is a transition from a more forest dominated world to a more open habitat grassy world that happened somewhere around 25 million years ago in the late Oligocene to early Miocene. All right, so when I say Western US, by the way, I'm talking today just about this region up here. And that's because this is where the vast majority of our data come from. So this is where we can do the type of analysis that I'm going to present. But we know about this uh, 
in part because of macrofossil data, but also because of phytolith data. So this is a compilation that was uh, mostly measured, but also brought together by Carolyn Stromberg, my colleague at the University of Washington. Uh, and she took all these phytoliths and used them to indicate the percentage of phytoliths that are coming from open habitats. So phytoliths are these little pieces of biogenic silica that grasses make. You can separate them out and you can look at them under a microscope and their shape or their morphology will tell you about the type of grass that produced that phytolith. Grasses that primarily exist in open habitat regions today didn't really become very dominant in these records until after what we call the open habitat transition. So this is what defines this open habitat transition, at least from a data perspective. And there's, we can also see this in the macro fossils. Uh, we just don't have, it's <laughs> too much for one slide to put all of that here. Uh, so this is a, a great compilation from Caroline to help us define the open habitat transition. I wanna give you though a sense for the magnitude of this shift, which is hard without a time machine. Um, but the best I can do is, on the left is a painting by Larry Felder from Central Oregon that is based on uh, all of the fossil data that you can see in the rocks that are on the right. So this is what Central Oregon might have looked like 40 million years ago, a much lusher, more closed habitat environment. And uh, on the right is zero million years ago. This is a drone image that we took out in the field. And it's clearly a, a more arid and less vegetated landscape. The open habitat transition was not this entire step from the right to the left, uh, or the left to the right but a decent chunk of this step. It was a major step toward the establishment of the modern ecosystems that exist mm -hmm. in the Western US today. So why did it happen? This is the big question that we don't have a good answer to. Uh, the first proposed solution is that it was related to global temperature change. And this is based on just correlating that there was a shift in global temperature at this time. The most updated temperature curve doesn't really show any changes here. So this is from the Westerhold et al. 2020 compilation. Uh, there's no, it's one of the most boring <laughs> times in global temperature history is the open habitat transition. The previous temperature curve did show a blip here. There was an increase and a decrease. And if you buy the previous curve over this one, that's okay. Uh, there's still some challenges, which is that we don't really understand yeah why an increase and a decrease would cause this unidirectional shift in the vegetation. There are reasons that this to totally could have happened, but they haven't been tested in the Western US for 25 conditions relevant for 25 million years ago. Uh, but the other challenge is that this didn't happen really anywhere else in the world. We don't see similar synchronous large scale vegetation changes anywhere else. So it's difficult to understand why this shift in global temperature would primarily affect the Western US, but not other places. So there's not a clear link to global temperature at this time. The main hypothesis is that summers got drier, as I mentioned before, but this hypothesis also has some challenges, namely that a lot of the evidence for drier summers comes from the vegetation transition itself. The types of grasses that showed up are the types of grasses that like to live in places that have dry summers today. So we fall into this trap of a bit of circular logic here. We're using the vegetation transition to interpret why the vegetation transition happened. We need some sort of independent evidence to test whether drier summers could have caused this shift. And this is where the clay carbonate compilation comes into play. So I compiled as much data as I could find and measured some new data to fill in some of the gaps. Um, this is the compilation for the Western US. And this was part of, uh, I'm also, uh, this is the Western, Central, and Eastern domains again, just like before. Purple is Western, orange is Central, yellow is Eastern. Uh, this was a decent amount of work to put this compilation together, but at the same time, I was also compiling all of the other types of proxy data for stable isotopes across North America. And I had colleagues of mine working in uh, Europe and in Asia. So this is Ellie Driscoll and Jeremy Rugenstein at CSU. Uh, and they were building out the compilations in those two regions. And this was, again, a tremendous amount of work. And we said, we never want to do this again, and nor should anybody else have to. So we put this together into the Patch Lab, uh, which is a large database that we're running. We're a small team, so we're still building out the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but all of the data I'm going to talk about today are readily available here. And this is a, a useful tool, I think, for analyzing different types of data. We have a ton of data available to us now, and it's great that we now have these opportunities to analyze global scale and spatial and large temporal trends in these data. Uh, so this is the compilation that we're going to focus on today, though. We're going to dive into the data now, again, splitting it up by west, central, and eastern domain, looking at the clay and the carbonate oxygen isotopes. This is the phytolith record from Caroline that I showed before, and I'm first gonna show you just the carbonate data. 
And what we care about here are the trends. We care about did something happen across the open habitat transition. So what I'm going to do in order to compare the west, central, and eastern domains to each other, I'm going to just scale their oxygen isotopic composition or, or translate it so that they have the same zero value because we care about the trends across the open habitat transition. So that's what the zero is. It's the average 18O before the open habitat transition in each domain. Through time, nothing really happens in the carbonate data. Uh, there is, there's no statistically significant shift in the before versus after open habitat transition in either of these domains, uh, nor do we get that a statistically significant shift just overall, as we see in the box and whisker plot on the right. And the clays are different. Uh, in the clay data, there is a two to four per mil shift in each of these domains across the open habitat transition. Now, if, if you came into my office and you said, hey, Tyler, I've got this cool new signal I've found in these clay data. Let's talk about what it could mean. Uh, we could sit down for a half an hour and maybe come up with uh, four to five different interpretations for what could cause this shift. We'll talk about some of those other interpretations in a bit and why they don't make as much sense as the one that I will, the interpretation I will propose. Uh, but that's the challenge with oxygen isotopes. They're really complicated. They're influenced by a wide range of factors. Collect developing an interpretation for oxygen isotope systematics is not straightforward. But when you see a signal that occurs in one mineral that doesn't occur in the other, that really limits the number of possibilities that we have for interpreting this signal. In this case, the simplest interpretation is that there is some sort of change that is affecting one mineral more so than the other, the clays more so than the carbonates. And the question is, how do we interpret that relative to seasonal climate dynamics, which we know bias the minerals relative to one another? So to interpret this shift, uh, we're going to go back to that big delta framework that I talked about before. This is just the oxygen isotopic composition of the clay minus the oxygen isotopic composition of the carbonate. Earlier I said that their co-equilibrium value is about minus three and a half per mil. I'm just going to subtract that out so that now the co-equilibrium is zero. Essentially, if the data point falls on zero, we can interpret this as clays and carbonates recording the same environmental information. What we care about is how do we interpret the deviations from zero. And to do this, we need to know two pieces of information. First, clays tend to form at the wetter times of the year, carbonates tend to form at the warmer and drier times of the year. This is something we established earlier. And second, winter is the low 18O season, summer is the high 18O season. I glossed over this earlier, but we saw it in this figure from before, where in the western, central, and eastern domains, winter is low, summer is high. I want to note that we're going to assume that this has been the case for the last 50 million years. And this is a pretty good assumption. Uh, we've run isotope-enabled GCMs with very different levels of atmospheric CO2 and very different paleogeography and tectonic conditions. And we get this same seasonal cycle, low in the winter, high in the summer, every single time. And the reason that it's such a, a robust feature of the climate system, it's, it's a good reason, it basically is related to very fundamental atmospheric circulation patterns. The westerlies in the winter bring in the stratiform precipitation, which delivers the low 18O. And the convective moisture that comes up from the south and from the east in the summer carries this higher 18O, largely related to the fact that it is so convective. This is a pattern that has held very likely for at least the last 50 million years and probably much longer. This is also the, the standard pattern that we see across most of the mid and high latitudes, low 18O in the winter, high 18O in the summer. So with these two pieces of information, we can now interpret deviations from that zero line in our big delta space. First, we can imagine if we have a winter wet climate, the low 18O season is the wet season. And this tells us that the clays relative to the carbonates will carry that lower 18O preferentially. So our big delta value will be more negative. And the more winter wet we are, the more negative we expect it to be. In a summer wet climate, the clays will preferentially take on that higher 18O. The big delta value will therefore be more positive, and the more summer wet, the more positive our system will be. So at kind of face value here, there are two main pieces of information that we can potentially glean from the big delta uh, reconstruction. Number one is the phase of precipitation seasonality, whether it's winter wet or summer wet. And number two is the amplitude. Are we very winter wet, or are we very summer wet? So we're going to carry this. Uh, interpretive framework forward and apply it to the Western US to look at the data that we already looked at before. 
I'm going to split it up between pre and post open habitat transition. So before the open habitat transition, when things were more forested, and after when things are more open. And I'm doing this because this is where we saw the signal, was across the open habitat transition. The oxygen isotopes are basically the same before and after, and almost all the change happens in that time. Now, in order to build some confidence that our interpretive framework, which up until now is entirely theoretical, that it's actually reasonable, we're kind of lucky here in that the Western US marks this really sharp gradient from a more winter wet climate in the West to a more summer wet climate in the East. And all of these GCM experiments that we've run for the Eocene-like conditions 50 million years ago, we still see this gradient. And again, that's related to the fact that we have the wintertime westerlies coming off of the Pacific and summertime moisture generally coming up from the south uh, in the Great Plains. So there should still be a gradient, whether it's more winter wet or less winter wet through time, we don't know yet, but there should still be a gradient over space for at least the last 50 million years. And what we're going to do first is look at just the most recent data, just the post open habitat transition data to get a sense for if we can reconstruct this gradient from a more winter wet west to a more summer wet east in the youngest data, the data that are closest to our modern calibration, or we can say for certain we know that this gradient exists at least today. So uh, again, we're splitting this up. West is purple, central is orange, and east is yellow. And in the post-open habitat transition, we're able to reproduce that gradient from more winter wet in the west to more summer wet in the east. Earlier, I mentioned that one of the leading hypotheses for what caused this open habitat transition is a shift to drier summers, which means that back when there were more forests on the landscape, climate would have had to have been more summer wet. So we can now test if this gradient has shifted over time with the data that we're looking at. And what we find is that climate was more winter wet before these grasslands showed up than it is today. So back when the landscape was more forested, all three of these domains are more winter wet than they are right now, indicating that a shift to a less winter wet climate, probably drier winters, was associated with this massive episode of forest dieback. This is not a terribly surprising result. Uh, we know that in the Western US today, the trees that still exist are preferentially using more winter moisture than summer moisture. We know that they perform worse when there's less winter moisture available. And it makes sense that the loss of winter moisture would be associated with this massive episode of forest dieback. But I want to give you a sense for the magnitude of change that we might be talking about with this shift. Because up until now, it's not really clear if this is like a small change <laughs> or a big change in climate. It's just a signal. So this is something that we're working on with a proxy system model that I'm developing. But for now, I'm going to use the very crude approach. Uh, I'm working on a paper right now about why this approach is often flawed in geologic studies. But we're going to use the good old fashioned space for time substitution. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is take the data from the post open habitat transition and compare it to modern winter precipitation. That's the x axis here. And we're going to take this line and use that to infer what winter precipitation would have been before the open habitat transition and do this space for time substitution. I uh, built a proxy system model to see if I could at least, as, as, as a sanity check, reproduce this information based on how I understand the proxy system to be working. And what I find is that, in the model at least, the big delta values are even more sensitive to changes in winter precipitation. So the ch same change in big delta leads to a larger change in winter precip in my proxy system model than it does in these data. Uh, so to reconstruct past winter precipitation fractions, I'm going to use the the black line, the more conservative line, that is just the, the data from the post-open habitat transition. And this is what happens if we color that plot based on the data that I just showed you, extrapolating out for winter precipitation fractions before the open habitat transition, back when the landscape was more forested. And the thing that jumps out is going to be what I argue is one of the main drivers of this shift, which is that the Cascades Mountains, which today block a large fraction of incoming winter moisture from the Pacific, we're not doing so much to block that moisture uh, back when there was more forest on the landscape. So the uplift of the Cascades is our, the, the simplest explanation that we know of right now for why winters would have gotten drier at this time. Uh, there's other tectonic changes that could also be contributing, like the extension of the basin and range. And we need to do more work to figure out if this was a one-step shift or a two-step shift in the data.
But this also makes sense because the Cascades region is hydrologically connected to the Great Plains today. That's what uh, this analysis is showing. This is output from Twinenberg et al. 2020 that I analyzed for this region, where we find that evaporation that occurs in the Cascades region is sourcing a fair amount of precipitation in the Great Plains in the winter and in the summer. This would have been an even larger fraction uh, back when the Cascades were lower. And this also makes sense in a very rough sense because the signals that we see are unidirectional. They happen once and they don't happen again. And this is what we expect from a tectonic shift that are these long wavelength forcings on the broader climate system. So I wanna talk about other ways that we can interpret this and why, that doesn't, why they don't make quite as much sense. Uh, there are other ways to get the same exact signals. One of them would be, hey, maybe it's not drier winters, but maybe it's wetter summers. This proxy system that I'm developing tells us about the relative fraction of how winter wet to summer wet we are. So we can get a shift to a less winter wet climate by having wetter summers. Uh, and one of the ways that we can actually test this is already in the data that I presented, which is that we feel confident that the carbonates are telling us more about the summer season, more about the warm dry time of the year, which means that if the climate change was occurring in the summer, not in the winter, we would expect the signal to be existing in the carbonate data, not the clay data. And this isn't what we see. We see the vast majority of this signal in the clays rather than the carbonates, indicating that whatever sort of change is happening is primarily happening during these colder months of the year when the carbonates, quote unquote, aren't really paying attention to it. They're not able to record that signal. So the shift to a less winter wet climate is more likely drier winters rather than wetter summers based on the data that we have. Another possibility is you can just increase the isotopic composition of winter precipitation without really changing anything else. What if you just increased winter 18O, but the seasonal distribution of rainfall was the same? That would increase the clay 18O, and it would change your big delta. So that checks both of those boxes. It's a real possibility. However, it doesn't make a lot of sense because all of the changes that we expect to have occurred over the last 30 million years should decrease winter 18O. These include the uplift of the Cascades, I'll talk about why that's not a problem in a moment, uh, and global cooling. Both of these should decrease winter 18O. And we see this increasing signal in the clay data. We can test this though, and this is something that we're working on. So I mentioned before, one of the ways that we can reconstruct seasonality are these biogenic uh, proxies. We can measure tooth enamel at a really high resolution, or we could measure uh, bivalves at a really high resolution and reconstruct the seasonal amplitude of 18O. And if we do this and we see that the lower end of that amplitude gets higher and overall 18O variability gets smaller across this transition, that's a good indication that the winter 18O was increasing. So we can test this. We don't have enough data to test it right right now, uh, but we're working on building this out. So we can, we can rule this out potentially more uh, definitively in the future. Another possibility is that maybe you didn't change the isotopic composition of the water in the winter. Maybe you just changed the temperature at which the clays are forming. Temperature is a really important factor in the isotopic discrimination between the water and the mineral. And so if you made the temperature colder, you don't have to change the water. You could increase the isotopic composition of the mineral without really any environmental signal other than changes in temperature affecting that fractionation. This also would be hard to do. It would require at least 20 degrees Celsius of cooling in the winter and essentially no change in the summer because we don't see anything happening in the carbonates. Uh, so this seems unreasonable. Whether or not we can test this is debated. Uh, so we can do, use clumped isotopes to get a sense for what the carbonates are doing. You can measure oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in the clays. We don't have enough data to test it right now, but you can measure that and in theory back out temperature, but that system seems fraught and I'm working with some colleagues on uh, a, a, a project showing why this really shouldn't work, uh, but you can in theory reconstruct temperature that way. Uh, and we're working on developing a new triple oxygen system to reconstruct clay formation temperatures with a new isotopic system. So we can maybe test this more rigorously in the future. For now, a 20 degree C decrease in winter temperatures without a similar change or shift in the carbonates feels implausible. So we're ruling this out, at least for relative to the uh, Cascades uplift hypothesis. We're gonna cover one caveat here, and then we are going to wrap this all up and put a bow on it and talk about bigger picture stuff. Uh, and the caveat is that if Cascades uplift is driving this, why does the clay 18O increase rather than decrease? 
Uh, some of the folks that are here might have worked on or have worked on stable isotope paleoaltimetry and related problems in the past. And what we know is that the basic assumption of stable isotope paleoaltimetry, which is using oxygen and hydrogen isotopes to reconstruct mountain ranges, is that delta 18O decreases when uplift occurs. It decreases on the windward face of the mountain and it decreases leeward or downstream. So how do we get an increase in clay 18O when you have uplift of the cascades? This is the uh, model that was first developed by Ray Pierre Humbert in the late 90s, early 2000s, and adapted by Dave Rowley for paleoaltimetry reconstructions. And what it shows is that as elevation goes up, 18O gets lower. It gets, and this, these are data from the Bolivian Andes, uh, just that follow along a line very nicely to show that the model is working. And we can find this just about everywhere that we look in the world, almost everywhere. If you measure 18O along an elevation gradient, it gets lower as you move up in elevation. What this tells us is that this relationship holds over space. It doesn't tell us that it holds over time because mountains play a really important role in the basic boundary conditions for atmospheric circulation and for precipitation seasonality, as we saw before, which means that other things are changing in addition to this signal here that can swamp it out or, or override it essentially. And we'll see how that might be the case in a moment. But one of the big challenges to this is that we have a lot of data. I've compiled you know, all of the data for the Western US and for Europe and Asia. And when we have independent evidence for uplift, we almost never see isotopic signals of decreasing 18O. We almost never see uplift signals in our paleoclimate proxy data. It's really rare. We don't see it really anywhere in the last 50 million years. We know the Cascades and the Rockies both should have uplifted around this time. And there's no clear signal of their uplift indicating that perhaps the bigger signal of large-scale tectonic change is not the spatial signal that we see here on the left, but rather the temporal signal of a change in precipitation seasonality that we see on the right. At least this is my argument for the Western US. We've also argued this for the Altai Mountains in Mongolia, that the change in seasonality is more important than this uplift signal alone. And this would work because as uplift blocks this low 18 winter moisture, what you're left with is relatively more of this higher 18 summer moisture that's coming up meaning that your clays are forming uh, with essentially more of the higher 18O summer moisture that can cancel out the winter moisture, the decrease in winter 18O. Now, an uplift of maybe a couple of kilometers at most would have an 18O signal of two to three, four per mil, whereas the seasonal cycle of 18O in the mid-latitudes and in places like this is upwards of 10 to 20 per mil. So small changes in precipitation seasonality can easily swamp out changes that you see from uplift alone. This relationship holds really well over space, but it doesn't seem to actually be making sense over time. So I want to wrap up with a big takeaway of why precipitation seasonality is useful and how we were able to apply it here. The main point of this is that this is a useful piece of information for reconstructing things like atmospheric circulation, the relative importance of the westerlies is what we talked about today. Uh, ecosystem dynamics, what does it take to cause an episode of massive forest dieback? and changes in tectonics and the relationship between atmospheric circulation and tectonics as we talked about today. The clay carbonate system works uh, in part by coincidence, in part because we have this really lucky thing where the co-equilibrium of clays and carbonates is constant at across a wide range of temperatures, meaning that we can just measure the clay and the carbonate 18O. We don't need to know what temperature they formed at, but we can get a good indication if they're recording the same environmental signal off the bat, if they're offset by about minus three and a half per mil. We can reproduce the spatial pattern from a winter wet to a summer wet climate in the Western US that we feel confident should have existed in the last 50 million years and find signals where there seems to be a decrease in how winter wet the landscape was as these open habitats became more pervasive across the landscape, indicating that winter aridity was a critical factor in driving off this episode of massive forest dieback. And there's a lot of opportunities to push this forward and apply this precipitation seasonality approach in other parts of the world. So we're going to come back to this. What I want to talk about is this big picture stuff now, which is how this fits into a broader research program. And this is a research program in the resilience of the Earth system to change. So this question of resilience is really a question of how strong are the positive and negative feedbacks in the short-term climate system and in the long-term climate system. And right now, we don't have very good frameworks either in proxies or in models that link the short-term system to the long-term system, meaning it's hard to know about what happened seasonally millions of years ago. It's hard to know about atmospheric circulation millions of years ago, and it's hard to know about albedo and ice and rainfall and forest feedbacks on these very long timescales. A lot of that complexity is absent 
from our models of the past. So this is one uh, thrust of the research of the next five to 10 years that I'm working on. Another involves drilling in the Amazon basin. So this is a place where land atmosphere interactions and feedbacks that are thought to sustain the Amazon and keep it resilient to climate change are really important. And what I'm going to be looking at is uh, whether or not these land atmosphere interactions are critical in maintaining the rainforest over millions of years of time as we drill into the Amazon. So I don't have data to show you here yet because we haven't started drilling, but I'll be down in Brazil in May. So hopefully I'll have more to share soon. And finally, uh, we need more models that can scale up the short-term complexity of the Earth system to the long term. This is absolutely necessary for translating the lessons of Earth history to the lessons of today. Because if our long-term understanding of climate evolution sits in this long-term box where we can't understand the role of short-term dynamics, then it's very difficult to understand what aspects of the past are directly relevant for the future. So this involves uh, a new model that I'm developing for monsoon circulation and for atmospheric circulation related to uh, the surface energy budget and land atmosphere interactions. This is with Marisa and Abby. Uh, and what we're f working on right now is the relationship between the Indian summer monsoon and regional albedo, or changes in land surface cover. Uh, and we're looking at the relationship between grasses and forests in the Sahara and how this can pull the monsoon in the east-west direction, uh, driving changes in vegetation, but also changes in global weathering fluxes. So we're coupling this model to a carbon cycle model. This is part of a, a broader term, longer term uh, research project. And in this carbon cycle model, we can begin to investigate the importance of quote unquote short term feedbacks that take, out, take place over decades to hundreds of years and how they relate to long term climate. So in this case, we're looking at whether short term bi stability uh, this is where you can have for the same CO2 level two different temperature states, one with polar glaciers and one without polar glaciers. If you can get that biostability on long time scales, perhaps explaining the ice house greenhouse transitions of Earth history. And so when we have this, this energy balance model that can reproduce this biostability and we couple it with a model for long term carbon cycle and climate dynamics, what we find is that the biostability essentially collapses. It doesn't persist on long time scales. So this is a feature of the short term climate that is likely not to drive long term climate evolution. And we're looking at how these types of albedo feedbacks can uh, be uh, important for long term climate evolution in other areas as well, especially the tropical rainfall albedo feedback I talked about a moment ago. Uh, so this is just an indication that there is a little window of biostability that can persist. It's really narrow and the background variability of the Earth system will generally swamp it out so that it doesn't matter. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you can only really get at by building out these short term quote unquote models to interact with climate over millions of years of time. So these are the three major research thrusts of the next five to 10 years, all built around this idea that we need to be analyzing climatic feedbacks and variability across time scales in order to understand problems like how resilient are certain features of the earth system to climate change. So I'm going to leave this up to maybe jog any memories or ideas about questions that we might have. Uh, but thank you all for your time and happy to take any questions. Also, I don't know how to pull up the chat on Zoom. So if anybody I would, I, I thank you. you. <laughs> I appreciate it. And if someone here asks a question, they can't hear it so you can repeat it. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, for the Western US, you had changes in seasonality accounting for the transition to grasslands. But in places like Africa or Europe, would you say that that is a, a similar, how do you think that mechanism um, relates to what the previous assumptions were about that uh, transition to grasslands? Uh, I think that they're potentially related. So I'm working on this right now in, in South Asia and uh, in Northeast Africa, looking at clay carbonate differences. We don't have enough of the data yet to really compare this, but I think it's not so much the westerly influence, but rather changes in monsoon circulation and monsoon climate. Uh, this is a hypothesis that we're testing. This comes out of the modeling work that I showed you before, where there seems to be a strong feedback, a positive feedback between rain and vegetation uh, that should lead a screaming signal in essentially the, the change in monsoon circulation as grasslands and then deserts kind of expand in Africa. Uh, in Europe, I think the North Atlantic probably plays a really important role and there's a lot of work that is uh, left to do in linking what's happening in the North Atlantic in the last 20 million years to changes in terrestrial climate in Europe and 
I don't have the clay data to compare there. Uh, I think precipitation seasonality is probably an important factor, but when I say this, what I really am saying is that atmospheric circulation and the annual water balance is also probably really important. Uh, and teasing those apart, whether it was specifically the fact that it got drier at this time of the year versus it got drier overall, is something that needs to be pushed forward from the dynamic global vegetation modeling standpoint and from more theoretical things. We can't get at that difference very easily with data alone. Yeah. Um, thanks for a great talk. That was really interesting. Uh, so, so my question relates to uh, kind of long term, I guess, on our lifetime, but not on the global time scale. Events, natural disasters, let's say, that can influence water availability in the, the ground. Let's say in Australia there have been 15, 20 year droughts mm -hmm. where parts of the country haven't seen water for that period of time. How do those somewhat more random but still quite influential events affect your framework and your data generation? Yeah, so the question is about changes in the time scale of wet versus dry conditions and whether or not the seasonal signal should really be the one that stands out in the data that we're looking at versus you know, multi-decadal droughts that can really impact the seasonal supply of moisture. And this is a question that right now I don't have a really great answer to, but we're building this out in the proxy system model with sophisticated soil geochemical models so that we can test what happens over the course of hundreds of years to soil carbonate formation and to clay formation and whether or not these signals exist. My hypothesis, my guess, I guess, more of a hunch at this point, is that the seasonal si th these minerals are generally integrating time scales of a few hundred to thousands of years of time per sample. So my guess is that we're capturing a long-term climatological mean, uh, but other ver like changes in, in shorter wavelength or higher frequency changes, like if there's a change in ENSO uh, from one time period to the next that maybe doesn't have a direct impact on seasonality that happens on you know, a different cycle, three to seven years or so, that could change the big delta, the, the clay carbonate difference I'm talking about. And one of the things that we're going to be looking at is essentially the frequency decomposition of if we put all of these different uh, frequency variations into the model at the seasonal scale, at the multi-decadal scale, and change the non-seasonal components, what is the magnitude of change in the isotope? So this is something that we're working on from the theory side to see if we might get signals that are not just seasonality from these other things winning out, essentially, or how much they should matter, but I don't have a good answer for you right now. Thank Thanks. You. <laughs> yeah. Hypothetically, everything else being equal, wouldn't you see the same trend if deep earth was coming out of public, or let's say global glaciation, like snowball earth, or like regional glaciation? So the question is, all else being equal, should you also see a decrease of winter wetness from changes in glacial conditions. Yeah, uh, let's say the entire southern west was covered by the glaciers that it was coming out of that glaciation period. Wouldn't you see the same trend? We would have the other problem of uh, not being able to access any of this material. But um, I don't know. So in a snowball earth world, the atmosphere is so dry that Dist and, and the seasonal temperature variations are not quite as huge that distinguishing winter to summer maybe is a more difficult question. Uh, we're working on some modeling of snowball earth right now and so this stuff is kind of fresh in my head. Um, whether or not we would see a change in the seasonality that looks exactly like this, do you mean in this place specifically in the mid-latitudes as well? Yeah, um, less winter wet to more winter wet if there was more uh, melting in the blue, for example. Yeah, it, it could be. Um, my my like, hypothesis about what you'd expect here is that the primary driver of changes in, if you don't change anything about circulation, you don't change anything, you just change temperature, which can impact things like convective intensity and atmospheric moisture, uh, that you're going to have similar changes in the summer and in the winter. Maybe you have a bigger change in rainfall in the summer as you weaken convection, which is more important for rainfall in the summer. Uh, but overall, the decrease in atmospheric moisture content will be maybe even larger in the winter than it is in the summer due to a larger change in temperature, um, depending on where you fall on the clausius clapeyron curve. So my hunch is that it would be premature to say that just changes in glacial conditions alone would give you the same exact signal. We see similar signals with changes in glaciations in like the Pliocene and Pleistocene, for example, but they're primarily related to, or at least we think, one of the main drivers is changes in the ice sheet 
directly impacting atmospheric dynamics and bringing more winter moisture to places of the western U.S. that are now drier and not receiving as much moisture from the westerly jet. So just the thermodynamic response of the atmosphere alone I don't think would give you this signal. But the dynamical response of atmosphere, atmospheric circulation interactions with the ice sheet I think could. Matt, anything online or? Yeah, Ben raises his hand. Uh, no questions in the chat though. Ben raised his hand. I don't know if we can hear Ben, but no, no, Ben, he helps to put it in the chat. Okay. Okay. Ask him well, to put it let in me the just chat. try asking. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can hear. Okay. Okay. Great. Hi, Doug. This is Ben Black. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk. So uh, my question uh, is about the work you just showed briefly at the end about. Um, interrogating by stability in climate states. And so it sounds like what you're finding is that actually on longer terms, things collapse down. And my question is, what does that mean for how we might think about tipping points in the climate system? Does that mean like uh, when you cross these thresholds, that might lead you to accelerate the change more quickly, but the final state that you would end up in is more or less the same or how would, how would you think about that? So the question is about, I guess I don't, uh, may, maybe in case people didn't hear it here, I'll repeat it anyway. The question is about what is the implication of the collapsing of biostability for tipping points in the long-term system? And my answer to that is that the tipping points, let's, let's imagine that that biostable framework exists. And this is still a big question of debate in broader climate dynamics. Is the climate system really biostable or not? Uh, models disagree on this answer, and paleoclimate data disagrees on this answer, depending on how you interpret it and who you believe. Um, but let's imagine that it is. Let's imagine that it is bistable, so these tipping points do exist from an ice house to a greenhouse, and they're really abrupt. Uh, the argument is that they can exist and persist for timescales of tens of thousands of years, but the thing that collapses it that I didn't mention are the negative feedbacks that maintain habitability in our planet, like the silicate weathering feedback and changes in organic carbon burial. And so you would get that tipping point and you would register an abrupt change in the climate system if your samples were able to capture that kind of resolution. Uh, but you would see that it, it goes away. It doesn't, it, it's not, it's not a unidirectional new stable equilibrium of the system indefinitely. You're not going to sit there indefinitely because the negative feedbacks that maintain habitability will push you back to where you started, essentially. So the, the idea of a tipping point is that you might be in one state of the system and then you tip to this new state and you just get stuck there, essentially indefinitely. You're in this new stable equilibrium. Uh, and the, qu the, what, the reason that's a challenge is that means that your new climate state is divorced from the contemporaneous forcings and feedbacks in the system because you just had the same forcings and feedbacks in a completely different state before a little perturbation dumped you into this new one. And the question is, is that a reasonable interpretation for paleoclimate? Should we really expect long-term climate evolution to be divorced from the contemporaneous forcings and feedbacks? And the, the answer that we got is, is no. Uh, it does seem to be more or less quote unquote deterministic that the contemporaneous forcings and feedbacks can explain the climate state that you're in. You can cross a tipping point, but you'll end up going back to where you started from on the time scales of millions of years with which we reconstruct long-term climate evolution and observe long-term glacial inter interglacial cycles through the Phanerozoic, for example. These tipping points exist. Paleoclimate is a ripe opportunity for investigating where these tipping points are. I've, I've worked on this in the Amazon as well. Um, but uh, in terms of global climate, with the ice albedo feedback in particular, it probably doesn't drive long-term climate evolution. Thank you. Any other questions? Online? I do. I'm, I'm trying to raise my hand here if I can figure this out. <laughs> Go ahead, Carl. Yeah. Carl. Uh, OK, thank you. Yeah, j j interesting uh, topic. I want to go back to the uh, uh, mid-continent of the United States and the western part of the U.S. Uh, the thing that kind of surprised me was the abruptness of your uh, transition from forest to grass. Uh, I I'd, I'd be curious about your definition of grasslands. It's my understanding that, that there's multiple different types of grasslands that evolved in the mid-continent during uh, uh, the expansion of grasslands later on in, in the Myopliocene. Uh, so, I, I guess what surprises me from what I do know about the faunas and floors that, that they weren't as abrupt as the data are indicating here. Uh, so, so can you expound 
explain a little bit more about this catastrophic appearance of uh, change from uh, you know from forest to grassland? It's, it's just not ringing true with what I'm uh, familiar with. Yeah. So so Carl's mentioning that my data show an apparently abrupt transition and that the maybe the, the true grassland expansion that occurred, and by the way, I'm talking about C3 grasses here and also the open habitat transition more broadly. So some of these, what I'm calling grasslands are more open habitat shrublands maybe. Um, but this transition, so in the oxygen isotope data, it, can, it seems surprisingly abrupt, at least in Oregon and in the Western domain. And we're exploring the, the possibility that this is because a long wavelength change in uplift had an abrupt impact on climate where you hit some kind of critical threshold where the mountains are able to be much more effective at blocking that wintertime westerly moisture. Uh, and this would have you know, an abrupt onset of a, of a rain shadow. The reason that I think it, it so I know what you, what you mean, Carl, that this is a challenge of other records show that there was still some some ever wet taxa that persisted into the opening of these landscapes. And was this really a, an abrupt kind of like immediate transition? And I don't know the answer, but I think that it appears very abrupt in the data, in the phytolith data, because we have this bias that is not our fault to sampling from basins. Uh, these are the low elevation regions where we're not capturing any orographic rain out. The, if you look at the Western US today, the places where you still find forests, where you still find the flora and the fauna that are more indicative of a forested landscape, these are not in the basins necessarily, unless you're in a riparian system. These are up in the highlands. These are places that capture more orographic rainfall and have more moisture available to support trees. Uh, and so I think that depending on what signal you're looking at in the geologic record, uh, you know, we still find evidence of, of ever wet taxa or at least wet adapted taxa like gingers and palms that exist through the open habitat transition and persist for a little while after. And the indication there is that this didn't, this wasn't a blanket mosaic, everything got so dry that the whole Western US became a desert or became this grassland, but rather this is, a really complex pattern of, of forests existing preferentially in the highlands and the open habitats sh opening up in the lowlands that looks a lot more like what we see today. Uh, so there, there are still like refugia, if you will, uh, like small little refuges, areas where you can keep the stuff that's more wet adapted or forest, attack, or forest adapted throughout the, uh, the transition. One of the things that we're working on now is a reanalysis of the, the biodiversity of fauna across this transition because it appears that there is first an increase in diversity and then a huge drop off after grasslands became more abundant, potentially like a niche filling boost in diversity, and then it all goes away. Uh, but this is really a, the records that we have are records of richness, and this is going to be very biased by the kind of taphonomic bias I'm talking about here, where we're sampling in the basins and maybe not getting so much information about the highlands. So we're reanalyzing this with a new ish technique for paleo uh, for paleontology and paleobiology called capture mark recapture which is something that ecologists are doing uh, in the modern system but allows us to get beyond this taphonomic bias um, and better understand uh, if what we're seeing is a local signal restricted just to the basins or also what's going on in the highlands as well so I, I think that the reason we see it so abruptly in the data is that this is predominantly what's happening in these lowland basins if, if I can ask a quick yeah. follow-up so, to that the, the, little, the little question I'd like to add on there is about, have you looked at the effect of volcanism uh, on, on the 25 million year old shift? Uh, we have some of the largest catastrophic volcanism in the Great Basin at that time, which is affecting the entire Great Plains uh, in the western part of the uh, sedimentary record as well as, which would affect clays, of course. Yeah, so I, I haven't looked at specifically the effect of volcanism on the open habitat transition itself, which would be a fun thing to look at. Um, a lot of the clays that I'm sampling are airfall ashes that are weathering in place from these volcanic events. Uh, and you know whether it's the uplift of the Cascades or whether it's something else happening uh, in the basin and range, as in terms of the tectonic driver, both of the, which would have the same impact of decreasing winter moisture. Um, I don't know if volcanic events could be enough to cause a unidirectional change in the vegetation system. Uh, but it's worth thinking about more. Brent probably wants to follow up. Okay. Yeah, Carl kind of took some of the wind out of my sail, but with these large scale dash flow tufts that are very predominant about that time, would tremendous, have a tremendous change in the albedo of the surface, as well as the topography. You would start muting the topography. Um, you might, so you would get less, I don't know if that would increase orogenic, but it probably would increase orogenic effect. 
And also, about that same time, you're starting to open the basin and range up, so you're getting more land mass between marine air coming in from the west. I know that's a really impossible or difficult model, but it's, is it a, you know, cause is not effectively, you know, necessarily a correlation, but the, the transition is right, right there. These big volcanic yeah. flow tufts are starting to really perm, you know, cover the basin. Of yeah. All of that the proto basin and rain. Yeah. And from geochronology and stuff I've done there, I know that there was a lot of subdued topography prior to about five, eight million years ago and that the, that basin and range really starts breaking up at about eight, ten million years ago. So I mean I think tectonics and origin you know has a big impact, you know, on on how how it's changed and made the West more arid. Yeah. And and the reason that I focus on the Cascades, to be clear, is for two reasons. Number one, we don't have the temporal resolution for the clay record to tease apart uh, if this is all happening right at 25 versus later in the, like, toward 20 to 15 MA um, if the, in terms of the 18 signal. But we also see this in, in central Oregon where a lot of what you're describing would be downwind. So I, th I think, you know, what we're going to explore next and what we're working on now is the possibility that, it, like, what you're getting at, I think, is that this is two different things that had the same effect on winter precipitation, where uplift of the Cascades blocked winter moisture. Basin and range extension and changes in topography in that region further made it harder for these air masses to penetrate further inland and had essentially the same effect of decreasing how much winter moisture was penetrating inland. And if you increase the albedo, you're going to get more uplift and thermal uplift. So it's, I, I, I mean, I can see, you know, imagine a big ash flow of tens of meters of thick you know, thick. I mean, what happens to all the trees that create the microenvironment that's more moist? They're gone. So all of a sudden, you're in a very dry, high sun, high uh, soil insulation, solar insulation. Right. Yeah. It's, so uh, it's an interesting, and I think yeah, your data might be able to tease that out. Uh, if I think if we had a higher t spatial resolution, uh, we could. I what I'm. Well, I mean, I've done some work on basalts where we've used basalt flows to look at clay development. I mean, some uh -huh. of the proper profiles, particularly in the, uh, the seam of volcanic field. But okay. I think under, if you could look at preserved uh, soil profiles under lava flows, you could time sequence, oh, this is a 10 million year old soil. What was the clay carbonate ratios telling me about time temperature relations at a 10 million year? So you might be able to go back through time if you find that, I mean, there's a the bunch right of markers. Your old basalt flows that are that are capping soils underneath them, and I, yeah. I think if you dig that deeper, you might be able to put whole a nice time series together of the uh, carbonate oxygen clay ratios. Yeah, yeah, I, I think this is a great a great point, and it's something to to think about and, and work on further. I'm not totally sure that a change in albedo from like volcanism that persists for maybe a few million years. W even that, at that point would be enough to fully just cause, out. yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> it's the kind of thing that would be really fun to think about and analyze more. And I'll, I'll look back at my data set and see if I can see anything in terms of where I've sampled relative to the salts and other markers that would be useful. Yeah, but, I, yeah. but I think the potential in the basin of range to take snapshots back yeah. is there because of the- we, These the all sp uh, ash beds that are, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Covering and preserving ancient soil. Mm -hmm. analyze. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. You got him for 30 minutes tomorrow. <laughs> Let's thank Tyler again. Thank you.